If you haven't done so yet, pause the video, reread the problem first before listening on. We have a long non-conducting solid cylinder. So that's been drawn in black. It has a radius of four centimeters. We've labeled that radius capital R. And in part A of the question, we have to calculate the electric field at a distance of R equals three centimeters. So notice that lowercase r is smaller than the uppercase r. We can even label that here. So that's going to be our lowercase r. We're trying to figure out the electric field at that distance there. And what we've done already is we've drawn a cylindrical Gaussian surface. So that red cylinder that's kind of dotted there or dashed, that is our Gaussian surface. We've drawn it in the shape of a cylinder because that shape coincides with the shape of this solid cylinder. And the great challenge of this question is to actually figure out how much charge is enclosed inside of that Gaussian cylinder. So how much charge is located within that red cylinder. That's going to be our first task is to talk about how to do that. Now that Gaussian cylinder cylinder is solid, but in order to determine the amount of charge within it, we actually want to imagine taking that Gaussian cylinder and dividing it up into a bunch of shells, a bunch of cylindrical shells. Now, we're going to go ahead and draw one of those cylindrical shells right now. There is one of these shells. It is cylindrical. It's got a very teeny tiny thickness, as you can see. Now, it's kind of hard to describe, but imagine that you are going to want to figure out the volume of this cylinder. Now, one way of appreciating the volume of this cylindrical shell is to imagine cutting it longitudinally. So if we cut along this axis here and then sort of unfold it, if we did that, we would end up with a rectangular shape. So we're going to go ahead and draw that. So we've unfolded that, and then this dimension here would be the length of the cylinder. This dimension here is actually going to be the circumference of the circle. So when we cut it and unfolded it, this circumference here becomes this dimension right here. Now, of course, circumference is 2 pi r. And then we have a small bit of thickness to our shell. We've tried to show that. That thickness would be the dimension between these two arrowheads. Very, very tiny thickness. So if we were to draw that here, we might draw it as a very tiny dimension, kind of pointing away from you into your computer screen. That is supposed to be that thickness. Now, because it's so tiny, we're going to call that a dr for its thickness. In calculus, when you have a tiny dimension, you use differential notation to represent that. So that tiny little thickness is going to be dr. Now, looking at this shape on the left side of your screen, that's essentially a rectangular prism. And the volume of a rectangular prism would just be sort of its length times its width times its height. So basically multiplying the three dimensions together, you would get 2 pi r multiplied by L, multiplied by dr. That's going to be the volume of this cylindrical Gaussian shell. Now, we don't want just the volume. We want the charge. So let's move on to the charge. And we're going to actually call that charge dq. And the reason we're saying dq is it's because it's a tiny amount of charge. Remember, this shell that we're looking at has a very tiny thickness. So the amount of charge on it would also be very tiny. Now, that charge is going to equal the volume charge density times the volume of our cylindrical shell. Now the question gave us the volume charge density. They said it was this weird expression a times r squared. Basically that just means that the charge depends on the radius of our cylindrical shell. So we're going to actually make a little substitution here. The rho becomes a times r squared and then the volume as noted was 2 pi r times l times dr. So that's the amount of charge on that single Gaussian cylindrical shell. But now imagine you take a bunch of these shells and kind of nest them one inside the other. And by doing that, you can build up the complete Gaussian cylinder that we drew earlier. So again, we're taking just the shell and then adding it more and more of those shells together, sort of nested within each other to give us that solid cylindrical Gaussian surface. And so to get the total charge on that cylindrical Gaussian surface, we would now just integrate. For the bounds, we're integrating from a radius of zero all the way up to the complete radius of our Gaussian cylinder. So the left side becomes the charge Q. The right side can be integrated, of course. We're going to be pulling out some constants. So A, 2 pi, and the length of our cylindrical Gaussian shell were constants. So we can take those out. And then inside you have r squared times r. That's, of course, r cubed. Now we're just going to integrate 
it's a relatively straightforward integration. You're just using a basic power rule. So you add one to the power to become R to the four and then divide by that new power. And then you're going to plug in your bounds. Your upper bound is R. So you're plugging that in for R. So you would have two pi times A times L times R to the fourth over four. And then you plug the lower bound in. The lower bound is zero. So when you plug zero in for this R right here, that whole expression becomes zero. So when we subtract off the zero, we can leave it simplified as follows. So this is going to be the total amount of charge inside our Gaussian cylinder for part A. Now that we have the total amount of charge enclosed by our Gaussian cylinder, we can turn to Gauss's law. Now Gauss's law tells us that the total electric flux through the Gaussian surface, which is represented by this integral, is going to equal the net charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface divided by a physical constant. Now to evaluate the left side of, the, of this integration, we have to understand that the flux is taking place through the sides of the cylinder. It is a long cylinder. If it wasn't, there would technically be flux coming out of the left end cap and also out of the right end cap. But because this is a long cylinder, the flux through the left and right end caps is going to be negligible. So all we really do need to consider is the electric flux going through the sides of the Gaussian cylinder. And we have pointed these electric field vectors away from the Gaussian surface. That is because the charge inside the Gaussian surface is positive, and we point electric fields away from the positive. And in addition, we have these so-called dA vectors. Now, it's a little weird, but you might want to imagine that there's a little square patch on the Gaussian surface. And what you do is you point your dA vector away from the inside of the Gaussian surface. Always point your dA vector away from the inside of the Gaussian surface. And what you can see is that the electric field and the dA are pointing in the same direction. That would be true whether we do it on the top or on the bottom, because on the bottom, the dA vector would point that way. Again, the dA vector and the E vector are pointing in the same direction. So that means that the angle between them is zero degrees. That's important because we can rewrite the dot product as the magnitude of the electric field times the magnitude of the dA vector and then times the cosine of theta. But since the angle between them is zero, the cosine of zero is one, we can actually just simplify it even further like that. In addition, the electric field is going to have a constant value no matter where we are on our Gaussian surface. That is because we are located a radial distance of r no matter where we're standing. So if I'm standing right here, I'm located a distance r. If I'm standing here, I'm located a distance r from the center. The distance is uniform throughout. So the electric field is going to be uniform throughout on the outside of our Gaussian cylinder. And because the electric field is uniform or constant, we can factor that out. And now we're just left with the integral of dA. And of course, the integral of dA would just be the sum of the areas of those little black squares. You go back and look at those little black squares that are all over our Gaussian cylinder. We're supposed to add up the areas of those, but of course that would just be the area of the side of the cylinder. Now maybe we all know that the area of the side of a cylinder from our you know geometry background is equal to 2 pi r times the length of the cylinder. So the area of the sides of the cylinder, again, is going to be 2 pi r times l. Now for q, we developed an expression for that earlier. We had that 2 pi a l r to the fourth over 4. So we're going to take that expression for q, and we're going to fill that in for the q in our equation that we are developing right now. Okay, now the fun part is that we get to cancel some terms here. Let's take a careful look. We've got a 2 pi on each side, so those are going to cancel. We've got an L on each side, so those are going to cancel. And then we have an R to the 1 here and an R to the 4th there. So we're going to be able to cancel one factor of R. That's going to make this R cubed. So if we simplify by canceling, we can see that the electric field E is going to equal, let's see, we have a 2, an A, an R cubed, over four, and then that's all over epsilon. We can further simplify because we have two over four, that's gonna to reduce to just one over two. And then this two right here can be kind of pushed to, oh, excuse me, we actually canceled that two. I think I just made an error there. Yeah, I'm sorry, that two right there and that two right there actually did cancel. So we actually still have a four, but that four can be pushed down to the denominator right here. So at long last, it looks like we have our expression for the electric field.
And now it's just a matter of plugging in the data. We have the radius of our Gaussian cylinder, which was the three centimeters. That of course is 0.03 meters. We have the value of A that was given, but I don't remember what it was. So A was two and a half micro coulombs per meters to the fifth. Now that's two and a half micro coulombs. So we got to make sure we do two and a half times 10 to the minus sixth. That'll put it into coulombs. And then the value of epsilon naught is a known constant. Good, so we've listed those values. Let's go ahead and plug them into our electric field expression. And when you simplify that, we should get approximately 1.91. The standard unit of electric field is newtons per coulomb. That is the correct answer to this rather lengthy question. But that's just part A. In part B, we're asked to calculate the electric field a distance of five centimeters. So let's draw a picture representing that scenario. So there is the black cylinder, and now the Gaussian surface is still cylindrical, but because its radius is larger than the actual cylinder's radius, we can see the Gaussian cylinder kind of encloses the entire structure, the entire cylinder, the non-conducting cylinder. Now, we still need to calculate the net charge inside that red Gaussian surface, just like we did before. Here's the expression that we developed earlier. Now, earlier we integrated from zero to the radius of our Gaussian surface, but this time we have to integrate from zero to the radius of the black cylinder. And that's because, let's not forget, that the charge that's enclosed by the red cylinder, all of that charge actually resides on the black cylinder. That's where the charge is located. So if you're trying to figure out, well, gee, how much charge is on that black cylinder, then you need to use the radius of that black cylinder because the charges actually are residing on that cylinder. There are no charges here, for example, in this little white space. So we wouldn't want to use the radius of the Gaussian cylinder because that little space, that little white space here and down here doesn't enclose any charge. So just be careful there. You want to make sure you're using the radius of the black cylinder this time. Now, if we integrate and plug in, we would have something quite similar. We would have two pi AL, and then we're going to have R to the fourth over four. But again, we're going to be plugging in bounds from zero to capital R. So when you plug capital R in for the little r there, this becomes capital R to the fourth. And then you plug in zero, which zeroes out. So this becomes the total enclosed charge. Now we can go back and use our expression we developed for the electric field using Gauss's law. So there it is. It's Gauss's law. We have the electric field multiplied by the area of our Gaussian surface. Now that's a key thing to say, the area of the Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface is the red cylinder. So if you're going to be doing the area of the Gaussian surface, it has to be the area of that red cylinder. The red cylinder has a radius of lowercase r. So be very cautious there to use lowercase r rather than uppercase r. And then on the right side, we've got the total enclosed charge, which we developed a moment ago divided by that constant. Now we can begin simplifying. It looks like we have a two and a two that can cancel, a pi and a pi that can cancel, and then the L and the L can cancel. So let's go ahead and rewrite our expression. And then if we divide both sides by little r, it cancels it on the left side, and then it would appear in the denominator on the right side, right there. So again, reminder, capital R was the radius of the black cylinder, which was the four centimeters, also known as 0.04 meters. And then little r was the radius of our Gaussian surface. That was bigger, that was five centimeters or 0.05 meters. Let's go ahead and plug in the known values. And when we simplify that, we should get an electric field of approximately 3.62 newtons per coulomb. That is the correct answer to part B.